Joining me from New York, former U.S. Representative from Rhode Island, Patrick Kennedy. In 2008, he publicly announced his diagnosis of bipolar disorder and years-long addiction with prescription medication. He has since gone to found the Kennedy Forum, and he has a terrific new book out, A Common Struggle. Here it is, A Personal Journey Through the Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction, a very important book and very well written, along with Stephen Freed. Patrick, before we get to the book, what's your reaction to Joe Biden's decision not to run? Well, uh, obviously, I love Joe Biden. He's uh, almost family, so close to my uh, late father. Um, very much, uh, as I said, I grew up with uh, Joe, uh, always around, and uh, such a happy man, a happy warrior for social justice, a tremendous uh, political career of public service to this nation. And of course, there's still more for him to, to do before he leaves uh, the White House. So uh, very happy for, for him. He's uh, an amazing human being who's suffered greatly in his life, but has always put the people before anything else. And that's why everybody in the world loves Joe Biden. Are you surprised that he didn't run? Um, I am not surprised. I think that he's uh, clearly got a lot on his plate with uh, trying to recuperate from the devastating loss of his son, Bo. Uh, and I think to try to manage uh, a campaign dealing with that kind of heartache uh, when you have all the rigors of a modern day political campaign, none the least of which a presidential campaign at that, I think it would have been enormously challenging for him. I, I think he definitely could have done it, but I think that he understood that it was going to be an exhausting process, not only physically, but emotionally. Are you endorsing anyone? Um, you know what? I uh, am endorsing whichever candidate has the most comprehensive approach to mental health and addiction. Uh, ironically, the vice president made his announcement today, and that kind of steps on what we were hoping to see the president speak about uh, later today in West Virginia about the epidemic of overdoses in this country due to opiates and the uh, overprescribing. Um, uh, every single adult American uh, has the equivalent of a, a jar of Oxycontin uh, in their uh, medicine cabinet, according to the CDC. Uh, 258 million Americans have been prescribed uh, opiates. Um, and so it's shocking that that public health crisis doesn't get any attention. But I guess when you have events like today's announcement by the vice president, it's clear that, you know, these stories always seem to get stepped on. Um, yeah. And so that's just an right. unfortunate coincidence. Let's not step on it. The vice president said that Democrats should run on Obama's record. According to you, how is his record on mental health and public policy toward addiction? Well, of course, uh, President Obama has overseen the biggest expansion of mental health and substance use disorder benefits amongst all of the health care expansion that he has pushed so much. Um, and, and yet, um, frankly, um, the president has done very little in enforcing those benefits within the um, Affordable Care Act and within the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. So what I'm saying is we need President Obama to tell his secretary of HHS to require insurance companies to follow the law. And, and the way that, that she would do that, Secretary Burwell, is require them to disclose how they do utilization management. That's the thing where they deny you care without telling you why they're denying you care. Unfortunately, most insurance companies are still denying coverage for mental illness and addiction, and they're allowed to get away with it. And frankly, it's like getting away with murder. Why? They are denying these cases left and right, and we need enforcement. And why? the Obama administration needs to step up to the plate and enforce this law. And why haven't they? Well, they haven't because, Larry, nobody cares about this issue because they're too afraid to talk about it. In our own families, we don't talk about a loved one who's suffering from mental illness and addiction. And guess what? If we can't talk about it in our own families, how do we expect uh, our political leaders to talk about it? They really don't see any constituency, Larry. That's the bottom line. 
And of course, there's no money in it. You know, there's no big lobbying group there. You don't see a bunch of people with mental illness and addiction marching on the mall. Um, and when they do, you know, they're far below their representative numbers in society. So the politics of this doesn't just add up. And that's the reason why no uh, political leader, including the president, has really done what this country needs them to do, and that is to speak out forcefully that the suicide rate, which is topping 42,000 a year, many of whom are our veterans, the overdose rate, which is 43,000, uh, you know, more than car accidents. I mean, this should be a wake up call to all of us. And yet, um, whether it's the president or whether it's any of these presidential candidates, you know, we're not hearing really what we need to hear in terms of an approach to you, the uh, forward. You call the book a common struggle because you deal with it as it covers your whole family, right? Well, you know, Larry covers every family. But yes, I'm starting with my own story because it's hard for me to say, go out there and get treatment. Most people, by the way, don't know that treatment is required by, you know, that their insurance company is required to provide it if you need it. Um, and so, but the biggest obstacle is they don't see this as a medical issue. They feel bad about themselves. They think it's their own moral failing. They do not look at it as a brain disease, as a medical illness. When you were diagnosed what was with bipolar, what was the reaction of the family? Well, I think that, you know, most uh, of my family members obviously are very um, uncomfortable about any discussion of these issues. And as I said, I think that's the common aspect. You know, my family is very unique in many respects, but, you know, we're very ordinary in the fact that no one in uh, my family wants to talk about these issues. And they're really not alone. Uh, I go all around the country trying to push this Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act and making sure people know that they have coverage under the law now. But you know what? Most people won't avail themselves of that coverage because they first don't want to address the very um, biggest issue of all, and that is the shame that occupies any discussion of these issues. You write very eloquently about your father, the late and my friend, Senator Ted Kennedy. You believe that your dad suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder surrounding the assassination of his brothers. You write that my father went on in silent desperation for much of his life, self-medicating and unwittingly passing his unprocessed drama on to my sister, my brother, and me. Did he recognize it later? I don't think my father understood that what he was suffering from uh, was a diagnosable uh, mental illness, post-traumatic stress. Um, I think it's even hard for today's veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan to really appreciate that when they have been traumatized because they've seen violence, just as my father basically witnessed the murder of his two brothers, uh, that they are actually undergoing a, a trauma to, to their brain. Your brain is affected when you experience such traumatic events. We understand biologically these things a lot better now, but culturally, um, we really haven't come to grips with the fact that these are real medical illnesses. And I don't think uh, that my father really appreciated uh, that he was suffering from post-traumatic stress. Is one of the problems, and I guess this has gone on for years, we've done so many interviews about it, that mental problems are not considered like cancer or heart or kidney problems. That's right. Um, except today, as the law says, if you're inpatient, in-network, or outpatient, in-network, or inpatient, out-of-network, or outpatient, out-of-network, or you need pharmacy benefits or emergency room benefits, you must, under the law, receive the same level of care for a mental illness or an addiction as you would for cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, you name it. That is the law of the land. Now, the fact that we cannot wrap our heads around the fact that these are real physical illnesses is irrelevant. It's the law of the land. It's just like when we passed the Civil Rights Act 
Many in this country still couldn't wrap their heads around the fact that we ought to treat everybody equally. And that's still very yeah. much the case in many places in this country. But it doesn't matter. It's against the law to treat other people in a discriminatory manner. That's what we wrote into the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Concerning the gun laws, is it discriminatory to say people with mental health problems should not get guns? No, it's like any other public health uh, issue. When you have people with uh, real um, issues that could affect the public health, you know what? You, you uh, have the appropriate responses. You know, that you didn't allow someone who has uh, uh, an illness that could spread, it could affect others, you wouldn't allow them to be able to actively uh, do that. We have, you take care of them. Now, with a mentally ill, do we take care of them? No, we don't. We, we have basically eliminated the number of inpatient uh, beds that we need in this country for those with uh, severe uh, and untreated, by the way, mental illness. And that, I think, is uh, really the reason why you see so many people who are homeless, why you see so many people who are in our jails and prisons. And uh, tragically, this is the ultimate manifestation of untreated mental illness when you see the kinds of tragedies that we've seen. Um, uh, because, frankly, in most of those instances, you had someone who was suffering and everybody turned their back on the person. And they turned their back on, on these uh, th folks because they suffer from an illness that is a taboo illness and we turn our backs and and yet if we ever were to treat these illnesses like other illnesses and treat them early like we would other illnesses you wouldn't have people end up in a situation where their illness basically takes over their lives and that has ended up uh, happening in this country because of our refusal to treat these illnesses like other illnesses. Do you think uh, it's in the genes? Do you worry about your children? Absolutely. Uh, I know my children are high, high risk. Um, and they need to be getting a, a screening for mental illness and addiction throughout their lives to be sure that their health care adequately covers the brain. And it's shocking, Larry, that we don't have a checkup from the neck up in, in every physician's office that we uh, go to get care for. And now it doesn't matter if it's a pediatrician or a geriatrician or an obstetrician. I mean, the bottom line is every physician needs to be concerned about the mental health of their patient, irrespective of whether that's the primary diagnosis, because you can't treat cancer, diabetes, or any other illness with also not looking at someone's anxiety or depression and propensity for addiction. Well said. Patrick, a great book. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Larry. The book, again, is A Common Struggle, A Personal Journey Through the Past and Future of Mental Illness and Addiction. It's out now and available everywhere.